So Haida Gwaii uh, has a very, very rich archaeological record that spans the last 13,000 years. And we hope to show that, um, that we have a wealth of archaeological resources preserved in the Guayanas marine environment, and that also archaeological work can really help uh, to understand uh, marine ecosystems in pre-industrial times. So tonight, we're going we're gonna to look at two different time periods. Um, one is the very, very early archaeological record that spans about 14 to 10,000 years ago. And Daryl's going to um, take you through this and look at uh, the environment of the time and also two very important um, archaeological sites, the Kilgi Gwai site and also the Gadu Din Cave site. And then uh, I'll take over and talk about the last 2,000 years and, and some of the different site types that, that we find at this, at this time. At this early time, um, basically most of Hecate Strait was dry land, exposed because of lower sea levels at the end of the last ice age. It was a broad open plain with no more than 100 meters of relief all the way across. And in fact, in the early times, around 14,000 years ago, it was basically a, a coastal tundra type environment. And it wasn't until 1,000 years or so later that the first forests started to move in and the environment became closer and closer to what we, we think of as Haida Gwaii today. All of this being to say that Haida Gwaii has been through some incredible changes, a very dynamic environment, and the archaeology that we try to learn on that environment is a very difficult target to reach, at least for part of the time. Recently, there's been a whole bunch of uh, new technologies developed that allow better and better modeling of the ancient uh, seafloor, or the seafloor per se, I guess. And for us, that's been a great benefit because it helps us understand what the ancient uh, landscape looked like. So obviously, the Canadian Hydrographic Service is doing the survey primarily for uh, charting the oceans, but the side benefit for us is that we get very, very detailed imagery of the seafloor. And I'm going to focus on a couple, one small area really, but the, on the, in the lower part here um, is a blow up of here. This is Juan Perez Sound. And a bit more detail here of southern Juan Perez Sound where most of the work we've done with the Geological Survey of Canada, Parks Canada and other uh, institutions working together has taken place. And in this image we can see Juan Perez Sound, the deeper waters being the location of the former um, sort of head of the glaciers that went out towards Hecate Strait. And so at the far right, where it says terminal moraine, that's where as far as the glaciers reached about, well, about 16,000 years ago, and they left behind uh, large uh, ridges of gravel and rock and material carried up by the glacier. This is uh, sort of a composite image of the seafloor of southern Hecate Strait, or, or Juan Perez Sound and gives you an idea of the kind of detail we can pick up in the area, what is a small little bit of what is now within the Guajanas Marine um, proposed reserve there. And in this image we can see, uh, so this is, if you imagine uh, sea level being about 150 meters lower than today, all of the features that we see here are part of the terrestrial landscape back then, 14,000 years ago. So we can pick out old river channels, flowing out to what was then a lake, uh, a whole series of, of deltas from different positions along of the ocean as it, as it moved up, terraces along the uh, river uh, channel, uh, gravel bars and bird's foot deltas and things like that, lakes, all kinds of features that are very, very relevant for archaeology if we want to try to find evidence of people on that landscape. So this is 14,000 years ago in southern Juan Perez Sound. 13,000, 12,000, 11,500, 10,700, which is the same as it is today, and 10,200 when sea level was actually 15 meters higher than present. So very, very rapid sea level rise. And as you can imagine, that had lots of consequences for where people may have lived on the landscape in the past and how we might have challenges to try to, to find that, that evidence. And we've done a bit of work. Um, looking again at the same area of Juan Perez Sound, uh, working with the Geological Survey of Canada and Canadian Hydrographic Service, um, working with this model and then going out with uh, CHS or the DFO ships and sampling the seafloor on specific targets, old um, river terraces, lake shores, deltas and such. 
And within that, that we used this as a primary tool, which was a, a dredge bucket dropped off the back of the ship, dropped down to the target sites, and then we pull up half a cubic meter or so of the seafloor, and then look through that to see if we can find any archaeological or early environmental evidence. And um, archaeologically, not a great deal, but we did find one uh, archaeological site at about 53 meters uh, water depth in the uh, western part of Juan Perez Sound. We also found a couple of locations where there were uh, intact forest floors perfectly preserved down up to 145 meters below sea level today. So this image, for example, here is one of the bucket samples, and the dark material you see here is the peaty a forest soil that is still preserved at the bottom of the sea floor. And there was even an in situ, a, a stump of a pine tree that we pulled up in one of these samples. And we dated that pine stump to, to 14,000 years ago, sitting at, on a terrace 145 meters below sea level today. Uh, this is the old so lake basin here. And then a, a terrace on the shore of that lake that we hope to sample, but it's about five meters or 10 meters too deep for conventional scuba diving. We did get a team in there, as I mentioned, and we had them go down um, and try to sample the area. They weren't able to get down to uh, 35 to 40 meters, but they did go down to about 30 meters and did some test dives, uh, tested their dredge equipment. We collected, um, they collected material down there and we brought it up to the surface and then did some screening with a sifting screen to see if there was anything there. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get back at this program in the next year or two and have a, uh, a closer look at this area, which we think has great archaeological potential. But there are quite a number of archaeological sites that are currently in the intertidal zone. They're very visible because of erosional activity, ocean uh, waves and currents and such. And I'll talk briefly about a site we call Kilgi Gwai, the very south end of Haida Gwai. It's a really interesting site. Uh, it dates to about 10,700 years ago. Uh, this is the site, this is Ellen Island, and the, the archaeological site is just here. This is Rose Harbor, an old whaling station from the turn of the century. Hecate Strait in the distance and the Pacific Ocean is right behind us. Working there was quite a challenge, uh, working between the tides. Uh, very, very inclement weather all the time we were there. Um, so basically the team would go in there, uh, work away in excavations, as you see right here, for a few hours. The tide would come in and we'd have to come back the next day. As I mentioned, it dates to about 10,700 years. This is excavations in progress here. And some of the detail of the shell midden that's preserved here. It's, it's a remarkable site in that um, it's basically intact to the point, to the point from where it was uh, drowned about 10,700 years ago as sea level rose up beyond this point. Uh, we see a number of uh, bone tools, stone tools, shellfish remains, a whole variety of fish and other animal remains as well. And what's really amazing about this site, although one of the ama many amazing things about it, is that it has very good uh, preservation of wooden artifacts. So these are wooden tools and cordage and things like that that were drowned by the sea 10,700 years ago and have survived because they've been effectively underwater for the past 10,700 years. And as well as the, the sort of conventional archaeological material, a lot of fauna, animal remains, that show that people were very, very fluent with uh, living in a maritime and marine area, uh, including many species, a number of species that can only be gathered by going offshore. So as you can see, about 20 species of birds and fish, quite a number of mammals, lots of black bear. Clearly, not only was the environment very functional, very productive at that time, but the people were very, very fluent with the use of that area.